Hey everybody, Nick Licamelli here. Today's video is part one of an interview that I did with a guy named Alex Enrique, who's a graduate student at Montclair State University and who works in the exercise science lab there. He and I really hit it off and see things very similarly and believe a lot of the same things. Not only is he a graduate student there, he's also a baseball player and a baseball coach. And again, we really saw eye to eye on a lot of different topics. He's a great guy, and I want to give a big thank you for the opportunity. I'll link their website down below. Be sure to check it out. They're doing great things in there, including body fat and body composition measurements. So stay tuned for future videos. But today is part one of an interview where we talk about my early life, how I got into physical therapy and bodybuilding, some contemporary issues with the healthcare field, and how I work to bridge the gap between strength and conditioning and physical therapy. Show notes will be down below, so you can skip to different parts of the interview if you'd like. Thanks, and I hope you enjoy. Hello, uh, my name is Alexander Enrique. Today I will be um, interviewing Nick Licamelli. He is a physical therapist at Professional uh, Physical Therapy. Uh, thanks for coming around, Nick. Um, and um, I guess first off, just tell me a little bit about yourself, um, your undergraduate uh, career, and what led you to uh, where you are now. Okay, so um, thanks for asking me to, for the interview. I feel like, uh, I don't know, I feel honored someone <laughs> wants to hear about me. Uh, so, yeah, I went to Ramapo College uh, for my undergrad. I had a uh, had to be a biology major because I was in the three plus three program. Mm -hmm. So that means I did three years undergrad instead of four, and then I went right into the the doctoral program mm -hmm. at UMDNJ. So I was accepted throughout the whole program from day one, like from mm -hmm. high school. So I applied to that special three plus three program. And once I got in, as long as I kept my grades up, I was guaranteed all the way through to school, which was nice, because usually you'd have to do four years undergrad and then mm -hmm. apply to grad school and not Three know. more years. Right, and that. three mm -hmm. more years. So it was nice. I didn't have to worry about not getting into physical therapy school. Um, so I did three years at Ramapo as a biology major, and then I went to UMDNJ, which is now Rutgers, for uh, physical therapy. What drew me to the field was um, honestly luck. Like my mm -hmm. my father had to have physical therapy done when I was a, like a sophomore in high school. So I went to the office he was getting treated at just to volunteer, see what it was like. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was always into sports and exercise, but never even really knew much about physical therapy. So mm -hmm. volunteered at this place, this small office in Nutley where I grew up. Um, they eventually hired me, so I went from a volunteer, then they hired me as an aide, so I was making hot packs and cold packs and oh, yeah. the tables, oh, right? I understand, I've, I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, uh, my grandmother was getting treated at another office in Nutley, and she said, oh, you have to come and meet this, uh, meet this guy. And that's the guy who I work for today. Wow. So I was an aide all throughout um, high school, college, uh, grad school, on and off, like on whatever mm -hmm. I could. And then I got hired right um, right at that office. But I say I got lucky because I just dove into physical therapy not knowing anything about it, really. Mm. And as I got deeper and deeper into it, I just liked it more and more. And I think it could have easily gone the other way. I could have chosen a field, and once you get into it, it's like, eh, this isn't for me. And then you have to back out and try something else. So I kind of dove in, took a chance on it, and it ended up, ended up working out, and I, I just liked it more and more as I kept going. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you talked about that uh, three and three year uh, doctorate program for physical therapy. Um, you were, they made you, you said they made you have biology first and then you got into more physical therapy yep. uh, when you transferred. So I, I just want to ask you um, when, I mean, that's a pretty big commitment to make at 18 years old. How, how, how did it feel to make that commitment? Were you excited? Like, or like, was there a doubt? Was there, you know, what, do you remember one tough time that you had? If you can talk a little bit yeah. about that mentality that you had back then. Absolutely. So that's a great question because um, it it it's so it's so true that um, you know there are so many feelings when you when you want to do something that in your little um, like group of people that you know, so your friends, family, when when you want to do something that they've never done before, or no one has ever done before. 
it's scary. Like you don't know if like you're you're if you could do it, if you know, if you're good enough for it. So I never, you know, taking this risk to to go to higher education and get my doctorate in this field that it was so foreign to any whatever anything my friends were doing, my family has done, it was a risk and very supportive. Like everyone around me is very supportive and and encouraging. Um, so uh, there was an orientation day at Ramapo, and this was after I got accepted into the program. And the dean at the time of the science school actually, uh, you know, got on the mic in front of everyone and and basically was uh, not very um, uh, encouraging. He was saying, you know, this program you're about to get in is not easy and too many people come from high school and, and they think that it's going to be easy and, and they end up failing out and not finishing and not, not being able to go through with it. And so from that, that day, I was almost like, you know what, like, I'm going to do this damn thing. I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it well. And, uh, yeah, and I, I don't know if there was ever doubt. I I used to get nervous with grades only because I had this set in my mind where I wanted all A's. So I set myself up at this high standard, and I was nervous that I wouldn't do it. And I ended up graduating Ramapo summa cum laude. So mm-hmm. I did, you know, I got the grades that I wanted, but... It was, um, I would kind of stress, not stress out, but that would be my main thing was the grades. I was focused on the grades. I needed an A, needed an A, needed an A. And I did whatever I had to do to get that A, and I got it. And then even in grad school, the first year in, in grad school, I had the same mindset. Like, got to get A's, got to get A's. And I did. I got all mm-hmm. A's that first mm-hmm. year, for second year. and But then my last year of grad school, I got to a point where I said, you know what? It's not about the grades at this point. I need to get this material in my brain so I can use it moving forward. So I said, I'm not going to look at one grade the entire year. Didn't look at one, not one grade. I got every test back, turned it right over, put it in my folder. Turned, mm-hmm. Didn't look at any test. Wow. No grades. That's tough. <laughs> didn't look at any grades. At the end of the year, I got all A's in all my classes. Yep. So that, that lesson that I learned was that I did the same thing every year of college. I got the same result. But that last year was a completely different mindset. So I was doing so much extra work and time and effort focusing on those grades when I didn't have to. I could have gotten the same grades and not had that mindset. Mm -hmm. There's a saying I like, and it says, um, just because you're good at something doesn't mean it's important. So I was good at... Getting good grades. Getting good grades, and, and the way I was doing it was focusing on the grades and I was good at that but that's not what's important Mm -hmm. so then that last year I kind of switched that mindset up and was like you know what I'm done thinking about grades like who cares honestly no one's no one's ever going to ask me what did you get in your what's your GPA like (laughs) at this point we're just trying to be better physical therapists so I said I'm going to free my mind and and uh yeah so that that lesson really uh, stuck with me in in a lot of aspects of my life. And that takes a lot of maturity. I mean, one of the things that I've seen, especially from the people that I work with here, you know, I'm a graduate assistant here, and, um, you know, it's it's that stress. And and for me, it's difficult. I'm a very intense person. I'm high intensity all the time, all day. You see me dancing when I'm not moving. Like, I'm just one of those guys. I'm very outgoing. And grades are very important to me. I'm I'm probably very similar to what you you know went through when I transferred back here. Um, I was taking 27 credits a semester. Like it was, I was really overworking myself, and I was a physical therapist aide, uh, which is not an easy job. Not an easy <laughs> job, uh, especially dealing with some of the physical therapists. Um, but that mindset, and 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 I've, I've kind of gone there this year. You know, I want to go and get my PhD. It's a little bit of a different, but still higher education, getting a doctorate. And I'm I'm kind of at that point where, you know, for me there's diff- there's there's l- getting an A on a test is a certain skill, right? For different projects, and you know, when I become hopefully a professor, I'll be able to do this with my students, give them projects that are uh, allow them to use the material to create, to innovate, not to imitate. Right. And that's that's like my quote, like my thing. It's I want to be an innovator, not an imitator. And um, you know, when, when you get to the point of learning that you can take what you're learning and create protocols and make, 
you know, build bridges, get other people working together. That that's a whole different aspect of knowledge and learning, and uh, leadership, man. You know, it's right. it's all those qualities, and obviously, you know, you you, you need all those qualities if you want to make it, if you want to do good. Yeah. Um. hundred percent. Yeah. So I, you you know, I'm also a professional natural bodybuilder. So yeah. everything I, so many lessons that I've learned from bodybuilding that pertain to life and. One of those is exactly what you just said. Like, couldn't have said it any better myself. So, when you, I started in bodybuilding, you know, you start with like the magazines and you read this and read that, and this this guy who's jacked is doing this, so I have to follow exactly what he's doing if I want to look like him. Mm-hmm. I have to take just what he's taking if I want to look like him. And then you find these people that you respect and you just imitate them and you do what they do. Mm-hmm. But then, as I dug deeper and got more experience in in the sport, and then you realize, okay. Maybe they're not the best sources to go to. Maybe these guys are who who preach. These are the principles. Make skills from principles. So you have specific the, to right. an individual. Yeah, exactly. So you have the tools, and then you 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 run with it. You make it specific to you, and and then you can you learn. So another saying is uh, we don't seek to be like the experts. We seek what they sought. So okay. in other words, we don't. I don't look at. Uh, someone and say, I want to be them. No, I want to be me. I want to be, mm-hmm. or I want to be the best me I could be. Mm-hmm. They're a good role model, but I'm going to take their good qualities and their bad qualities. I'm going to learn from them, and then I'm going to be me. Mm-hmm. And that's the same thing. Like that's mm-hmm. how you learn. That's actual learning from just kind of plug and chug and regurgitating things yeah. to actually absorbing it and then and making it your own. And like you know, this is. This conversation is it's very germane to where I am right now and to what I want to do in my future because, you know, it's, it's all about, you know, everyone has the skills, man. Like everyone can learn the skills, but it's about finding the right strategies for you yeah. to learn or to do. And, um, you know, I mean, independent study is basically what I want to do. And it's it's really it comes from within. It comes from motivation within and waking up every day. And, and it's so true. Uh, what you're saying. So I do want to ask you, um, you biology major, physical therapy, you also love strength and conditioning, um, you know, and you're obviously into the scientific field. What, is there any like big differences that you see or anything? Like, for example, I am huge baseball guy. I've played college baseball. I've been in the dugout. I've been in the weight room. And now I'm st- I'm studying so I can try to bridge that gap between the lab and and, and 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 the weight room and you know try to build a team that's working together and you know there's n- there's not a lot of that there's always you know I'm I work with this but I have nothing to do with you know what I'm gonna throw a hitter with two balls one strike man on second right. you know talk a little bit about how you. Um, kind of combined your biology undergrad you know that knowledge to now your you know strength conditioning um you know weight lifting and also what you do in rehab like yeah. you know it, it must be so much but you do it every day right you wake up right. and you have all this knowledge and you're like what am i going to use yeah. and you know maybe talk a little bit about how you kind of distinguish those fields absolutely so yeah so i'll start uh with so when i was in ramapo for biology I would always relate it somehow back to bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. Like I would always, I would stay late after class and say, we we have a lesson about uh, I don't know fats in in one of my classes, and I'd say, so I have a question. So if I, I remember this, this is an actual example. So I said, we talked about how fat uh, oils and water don't mix; they separate, mm-hmm. right? So. You know, like the natural peanut butter that has the oil on the top when mm-hmm. you buy it in the store. So I'm listening to this lecture. Afterwards, I stay after to talk to my teacher, and I'm like, I have a question. So, if I wanted to decrease the fat content in my uh, peanut butter jar that has like oil on the top, if I were to take the lid off and put a little water in it, wouldn't that cause the oil to rise to the top? And then if I just dump it out, that would remove the oil. And they were like. Uh, yeah, I guess that would probably work. But that's just the mindset. Like, yeah. I'm sitting in a class, yes. I'm learning something about how oil and, and water don't mix, and I'm like, huh, how could I make this, like, you know, I, I just subconsciously just related it back to bodybuilding, because that's what I was into. Mm-hmm. And that is the, that's the most challenging thing. The most challenging thing is taking 
taking what I know and making it mainstream and bringing it to everyday practice. Especially because you work with a lot of general population people right. that don't know, uh, you know, these terms and right. of anatomy, and you have it's your job to get them better and to yep. tell them what to do, and they have to understand you. It's mm-hmm. I, majority of of what I do is just educating because. Mm-hmm are the healthcare system and the the place that my patients are coming to me from is so skewed it's unbelievable so i am kind of picking up the pieces and and teaching people like no this is what you need to be focusing on so for example our our healthcare field is more like you uh you get hurt or you have pain they either prescribe you medicine they do some imaging x-ray mri and then possibly surgery and then afterwards you know whatever the outcome is say someone has knee pain do an x-ray or an mri say they see a torn meniscus they say okay you got a torn meniscus go to physical therapy for four weeks if that doesn't help maybe we'll do some surgery so they come to me but there's there's a reason why that meniscus is torn didn't just happen and and medicine and and uh and surgery is just a way to treat the symptoms mm-hmm. of the torn meniscus so for me i can't just take someone so say they have the surgery and they come back to me i can't like i can't just take that person and massage their knee and then like have them just you know go and live their life i have to teach them look the reason you have a meniscus tear we're going to figure that out like there's a reason why whether it's the mechanics of your foot whether it's Mm -hmm. the mechanics of your hip whether it's the way you're walking whether it's uh you know your a a leg length discrepancy Mm -hmm. we need to figure out why you had that meniscus tear in the first place pain is never normal so you're having pain for a reason i could get rid of your pain but the root cause is still going to be there Mm -hmm. so we're going to get at that so the doctor told me I can't, I shouldn't go to the gym and I shouldn't squat. Why? Did he even look at your squat? Did mm-hmm. he even? Yes. Right. So I get these patients that come in and say and say these things to me. And I'm just like, all right, I understand what you're saying, but let's take a look at your squat. When does it hurt? Okay, may it hurt like at the bottom. Okay, try a half squat. No, nah, it feels okay. Good. Go to the gym, do half squats. If that may be another reason, another thing could be um, uh, if a squat hurts, how do you squat with a barbell on my back? All right, try a goblet squat with a, a dumbbell in your in front of you, or try a front squat, or try a leg press, or try any. There are so many different ways to train your legs that could be pain free. So it's a very mm-hmm. simplistic uh, response to say squats hurt, don't squat, mm-hmm. or deadlifts hurt your back, don't deadlift. No. You need, throughout your entire day, you need to squat. You need to bend over to the ground mm-hmm. and pick things up. You need to pick up a laundry basket, load your dishwasher. That's a deadlift. Same exact yeah. form as a deadlift. So if these people are avoiding these things because they have pain, that's not, we're not doing them any any, any, serve, any yeah, service. Right. We need to teach them how to move and not so much that they're broken. So here's what we're going to do. Electric stim is going to heal me. Uh, anti-inflammatories are gonna are gonna heal my knee surgery is gonna heal my knee then I'll be okay no you got to learn how to move you got to you got to learn how to squat how to deadlift and that's where my background in bodybuilding and strength and conditioning comes into play because I can help them with that you were in the trenches you were in there right. you've been hurt like you you know Right. And, you know, I, the, I, I don't know if you know Joel Jameson. Um, he's a cardiovascular guy, but he's a cardio. He trains a lot of MMA guys. And I was listening to one of his podcasts one day. Didn't read his book yet, but I should. Um, and he's talking about his program. Um, I forgot which school he was talking about. But he, the successful programs have this triad of coaches, athletic trainers, strength and conditioning coaches. And whenever they're, they communicate all the time and they're a very successful program, why? Because of this, you know, communication and, and they're all on the same page using their expertise to get them better for this, to get them better, obviously, to, to, to play the game and then the coaches take care of the skill. And, you know, if life could be like that, 
right? You have the doctor who diagnoses, who sends him to a physical therapist, and says physical therapist not only, um, you know, provides the proper, you know, instruction, but also educates and then motivates. And then you get that internal motivation. The person goes and does it themselves, right? That's that's basically what right. we do in life. We we try to teach people so then they have that uh, autonomy to do it themselves. Yeah. And um, I mean that's just something that I've I really uh, see in the medical field, and um, it's it's kind of like my goal to try to bridge that gap. And 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 you know like right now, you know I'm I'm coaching, uh, but my team is the only one, the only team in the 13 to 15 year olds that do an actual warm up. We do our reset, we do our mobility, and we do our dynamics. Yeah. You know everyone else, they just pick up a ball, they go there, and you know it's all about setting that culture. Yeah. Um, and if we can just get people to buy into the process, don't worry about the results. Don't worry about them. They'll take care of themselves. Right. You usually do good. You're gonna get good. Right. You know that's just how I roll, and um, yeah, you know, that's really what I believe in. Thank you so much for watching. Look out for part two. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.